<laughs> okay, all right, now allow me to introduce our first plenary speaker. Uh, she is Professor Dr. Petek Askar, and she is a Middle East Technical University graduate in mathematics and physics. And that makes, <laughs> that, that makes it, I mean, I love mathematics. I mean, I have to say this, so I'm an admirer of you already. You have a fan. Uh, she got a PhD on educational measurement and evaluation. She actually worked for Izmir Economy University for 10 months, um, and uh, for Hajet Tepe University for 11 years as professor of computer education and instructional uh, technology, and for Middle East Technical University for five years as professor of mathematics. All right. Uh, currently, she's serving as a member of the Social Sciences Research Group at Tubitak. And she's been involved in several projects on ICT applications, both nationally and internationally. And she's also a member of editorial boards of several journals, including Elementary Education Online, of which she is the editor-in-chief. So please uh, give a warm welcome to our first plenary speaker, Professor Dr. Patek Ashkar. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, again <laughs> and uh, I'll uh, take this opportunity to, take, uh, to say thank uh, to the organization uh, team uh, for this conference. Uh, well, my presentation is about uh, numbers, let's say. <laughs> Uh, about data and how we can use data for improving teaching and learning processes. So it's a new area, emerging field, learning analytics, and mostly uh, the applications are all, uh, in higher education. Uh, it's more applicable in higher education, but now it's going to be uh, used in the K-12 a, a environments also. Um, my frame uh, is, let's say, uh, in short. I don't have a. I don't have any dance uh, period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, I think about it, but uh, later. Well, it's a serious. You know, it's a very serious uh, presentation. Learning analytics. Don't. <laughs> make any joke I said uh, the co uh, well I let, uh, the functions of higher education we all know but uh, we are going to focus on teaching and learning and uh, well uh, we cannot miss digital technology in higher education because learning analytics is related to digital technology and then I'm going to give uh, the definition of learning analytics and in applications and some research studies on it. Uh, and then I'll make a, a brief conclusion. Of course, some critics, because we are collecting data. Uh, so uh, we need some uh, critics on it. So that's it. So, uh, well, actually, uh, we all know that the functions and the role of higher education can be categorized into three broad uh, fields. One is the education, and we call the teaching and learning processes. The other one is the research environment, research, and the other, the third one is the community service. Well, um, uh, these are not mutually exclusive uh, fields. They are interacting. And any subcategory we can think about it uh, will uh, find a way in three of it, some interactions or other things. For example, uh, when we are thinking about teaching and learning, we see that research in teaching and learning is important in order to have some sound good principles for uh, the applications of teaching and learning. So uh, it, research and teaching and learning 
uh, go uh, to together. And also community service, uh, we are doing so much uh, uh, studies in schools, K-12 school, K schools. And so these are all together. It's not so, these are connected. It's not so easy to uh, separate them. Now, uh, in our uh, uh, presentation, we are focusing on teaching and learning, by the way. And when we see in higher education how we can handle the teaching and learning, uh, well, broadly speaking, these are the dimensions of teaching and learning processes in the higher education. What are these? Uh, effective design of curriculum and course content. How we can design the knowledge, how we can organize the knowledge, and how we are going to put the learning outcomes and the cognitive processes and the domain together. Well, there is a framework for it, uh, the Bologna process, and uh, most of the Turkish universities are adapting Bologna processes in their uh, curriculum. So it's, it gives us a standard for it. Uh, and the basic, I mean the important point of the Bologna process is to uh, put the learning outcomes. And the learning outcomes, you know, uh, is, uh, co contain uh, domain and the cognitive processes. Um, then comes the variety of learning environments, the methodologies, strategies, and how we can put into uh, implementation uh, for improving the students' uh, skills and uh, level. So there are a lot of, you know, uh, variety of learning environment strategies and so on. And uh, let's come to the assessment. Assessment is another part and it's very important part of it because the feedback is important for the students. So uh, how we are going to assess the students' learning outcomes and how we can give the feedback uh, is that crucial thing to improve the students' uh, way of learning. And also the student support services uh, is another issue. So these are the four main uh, dimensions of teaching and learning processes in higher education. Now, let's come to the digital technology then. Uh, I can categorize the digital technologies in higher education like this. We can add other things also, we can organize it uh, in a different way, but uh, mostly, uh, we have a learning management system. Now, I know that uh, Izmir University, uh, University actually uh, deployed Blackboard, as I it's a, it's a learning management system. And there are others, of course, like Moodle is an open source uh, learning management system, but it's widely used, I mean, the learning management system in higher education. The MOOCs, uh, as Kay uh, mentioned yesterday uh, in her talk, uh, MOOCs are, uh, you're all familiar with the MOOCs. It's the uh, open courseware movement. It is uh, important for Turkish universities to Later, I will come why it's important for the Turkish in, uh, universities. The digital, digital libraries and learning objects uh, is another issue, the archives of uh, educational materials. Uh, social network communities, communities of practice, and uh, the social media used in uh, higher education of course, the mobile technologies and augmented and virtual reality. You see, there are a lot of digital technologies we can use in higher education. Okay, so uh, what's the learning management system? It's a software application. Uh, so we can 
uh, use it for administration, for documentation, for tracking, reporting, and delivery of electronic educational technology courses or training programs. So we have an administration uh, unit and we are delivering online materials and of course tracking and reporting uh, of learning is possible while using learning management systems. What about MOOCs? Uh, as you know, it's massive open online courses, uh, and it's a platform for e-learning over the past five years, five or six years, and there are a lot of, you know, um, uh, let's say, uh, initiatives like Coursera, like edX, and uh, uh, the others. Uh, sometimes, uh, because of the dropout rate, you know, uh, the dropout rate of, uh, of MOOCs is very high, so uh, in some cases participants also have face-to-face -face support in order to eliminate this disadvantage. Um, Digital Library is a virtual organization and uh, which collects, manages, preserves rich digital content of all forms of its users. And digital libraries have a digital uh, repository and learning objects uh, are uh, in these uh, digital repositories. So what is a learning object? It's an educational material, a digital entity that can be used, reused, and tagged with metadata uh, aimed to support learning. So you can use a learning object in different contexts or in different uh, you know, um, classes, in different uh, uh, situations. For example, uh, think about a learning object of standard deviation. Uh, Probably you know what's a standard deviation. It's the statistical basic statistical concept. And you can use it in uh, statistical courses uh, given by psychology department or in a you know, sociology department or in math department, whatever, in economics department. So it's a way of saving time <laughs> and energy uh, for um, for everything. So, learning object design and implementation is a very important issue for the higher education. Now, for example, uh, maybe you are familiar with the, uh, with the multimedia education resource for learning and online teaching uh, since 1997. Uh, it's a free use uh, and uh, there are a lot of resources uh, in Merlot, and you see how many different types of educational material or learning objects. There are simulations, animations, tutorials, relent practice, quizzes, lectures, presentations, and in every field. So you can easily access such archives and use uh, these materials in your uh, classes. Now, uh, about social networking, um, as Kay mentioned about scope, scopes you mean, I mean, personal learning environments. Uh, so it is a, it's not a learning management system, but uh, this personal learning environment sup uh, provides support to students so they can take control of their learning and make their own learning environment. So it is getting important uh, uh, because they are using social networks and uh, you can uh, possibly use collaborative tools and like uh, small groups, web services, and uh, the student can easily 
make his own learning environment by getting learning uh, resources and make some collaborative uh, organizations. Now, let me give you two, two examples of it. One is the LGG, and we use it for the teacher training programs. Uh, it's a social networking engine, and uh, there are some uh, blocks, uh, I mean building blocks, like blogging, microblogging, file sharing, and networking groups, and some features. And social media in classroom is another one uh, to use it. Uh, as a personal learning environment, it's the free. These are all free, <laughs> free, free, free. <laughs> okay, free is an important word of uh, this conference, and uh, free and open source web web service. Uh, uh, so teachers and students uh, can integrate the social media in their learning environments and. We use it for the uh, uh, teacher uh, uh, candidates education because we have uh, in faculty of education teaching practice courses in the fourth year, uh, in the senior year, and uh, the students are going to the school to practice their teaching and they are mentor teachers in the school, the school teachers. So it's a... Uh, rather complex environment. There is an instructor or professor in the university and uh, in the, the school mentor in the school and the students and they're in a class, let's say, there are different schools, so different uh, mentor teachers and different instructors. So how we can get them together to have a meaningful learning environment. So we use this social media uh, in classroom. So it's very effective to use it because uh, you see there are a lot of blogs. You can make comments. You can use wiki and social bookmarking. You can put video. You can make some contributions on the video. So it is a, a collaborative environment and it's a personal environment too. Uh, I use Ashlar, okay. Yeah, well, we know mobile technologies. Uh, well, there is a now uh, initiative uh, called bring your own device, whatever it is in the classroom. Do you have, uh, if you have a cellular phone, it's okay. If you have a laptop or a desktop, well, I, it's not possible to get a de desktop, but you know, uh, whatever you have, please bring your uh, own device so that all applications can be used in different settings, in mobile devices or in uh, what the laptops or tablets and whatever. So uh, if the students are using this, we have to get benefit uh, of uh, these in the classroom uh, if they are used to. Okay, now uh, you know something about augmented and virtual reality and it's getting uh, a popular subject, especially for the research area in Turkey and in other uh, countries, I know from the TÜBİTAK projects, uh, how we can uh, develop augmented reality materials and how we can adapt it into, uh, you see, the classroom environments and the virtual reality. Uh, these are the computer-generated environments that stimulate the physical presence of people. Well, there are uh, certain uh, projects like HoloLens, Microsoft, and uh, the, um, for medical education, they are using it. Uh, well, but it's coming, you know. <laughs> it's coming. Okay. So, uh, if we have such digital technologies, what are the impacts of digital technology in higher education? We can see that 
Uh, personalization is important, and well, adaptive learning, whatever it is, it's not so easy to say the adaptive learning, but personalization, uh, personal learning environments, collaboration, uh, so blended models, hybrid models we sometimes call, so face-to-face -face, uh, MOOCs, online environments, and other types of flipped classrooms, for example, these are all all blended models, and learning analytics. And so this is our subject. <laughs> okay, what we mean by analytics? It's the process of data assessment and analysis, and we measure, improve, and compare the uh, performance of individuals, programs, whatever. So, uh, it's an emerging field, and uh, I'm going to talk about the differences between the traditional approaches, because we are using traditional approaches to assess uh, students and programs, uh, and, uh, and the difference between them. Okay, uh, then let's come to learning. <laughs> uh, well, there are two important words for learning. Uh, one is the engagement, the other one is the feedback. So, uh, uh, we try to engage the students in the teaching learning process and we have to give feedback to the students about their cognitive, emotional and behavioral engagement in order to improve their skills and whatever. So, so when we simplify, let's say, uh, the term, uh, it's a product of interaction. So interaction is important. How, yeah, well, the student interact with instructors, with the content, with the other people, with their peers, and so there are a lot of interactions going on. And uh, we as educators, uh, expand time to design the learning of students to maximize the value of those interactions. But interactions are important for the data. <laughs> uh, so as in instructors, we have a lot of questions in our minds. Every day we are asking these questions. How effective is the course? Is it meeting the needs of the students? How can the needs of learners be better supported? Which interactions are effective? How can they be further improved? Am I correct? Well, these are the questions that we are asking for 100 years. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Students want to know how they are doing, and they want feedback about their improvement. And faculty members want to understand the students' background, and also they uh, know or want to know whether their teaching techniques are effective or not. Okay, for the data, for the assessment. Uh, of course, we have observations. Don't forget it. As experts, we are perfect in observing students' behavior. But data is also, or are. Is it is or are data? Data plural, huh? <laughs> but sometimes we use is. <laughs> OK. Uh, traditional approaches uh, to answering these questions, how? by student evaluations, by the grades uh, of the students. Their the opinions, of course, the perceptions of the instructor, but these are all delayed, I mean, at the end of the semester. Or sometimes uh, you can make some quizzes and other things in order to get immediate feedback for the students, but in the universities it is uh, we have two midterms or one midterm or a final in order to give feedback about the weaknesses and strengths of the 
students. Uh, well, in addition to this uh, data, let's say, I mean the results, the numbers about the students, there are increasingly large number of education resources available. Uh, so, uh, how we can use this for giving feedback to the students and fee feedback for the program evaluators? There are a lot of online content uh, in LMS, learning management systems, and we know that they are locked. I mean, we are tracking the students' interactions in online learning environments. In every click, the students are recorded. So how can we use these records in order to improve the teaching learning processes? So what we see, data sets with log data. Okay, now, uh, well, you have, you are a data rich university, isn't it? Yes, universities are data rich, but information poor. Because in order to get a meaningful uh, aggregated number, it's an information. So how can we make meaningful uh, information by using data? So this is the emerging field of learning analytics. So uh, how this data can be used to improve teaching and learning? So it's an emerging field. Uh, and all you uh, hear about big data trend or uh, data mining, whatever. So this is the application of uh, uh, big data movement in educational settings. So what we want to do to get uh, data in order to see the meaningful information for the effective learning, don't forget this. <laughs> this is the critical word. For the improvement of student, for the improvement of the programs, for effective learning. Uh, so, uh, there must be a definition, of course, for the learning analytics. What is it? Measurement, collection, analysis, reporting of data about learners and their context for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. This is the definition of the, uh, uh, the Society for Learning Analytics Research. Well, uh, it is 2010 probably. Now there are some related terms. Of course, what are these, the educational data mining? Sometimes uh, you hear about business intelligence in the uh, other sectors, web, web metrics, academic analytics, and so all these terms are for uh, reaching the data, which is rich, and to analyze data to get uh, meaningful uh, knowledge from it. So the universities are using learning analytics. I'm going to give some examples. Uh, uh, for what? For some purpose, of course. Uh, for example, increasing financial and operational efficiency. This is the economical side of uh, uh, data analysis, improving, improving fundraising programs. And this is uh, what I like to see 
<laughs> helping educators achieve a better understanding of their students' learning process and abilities, enhancing student performance across courses, disciplines, and mostly uh, the widely used purpose is identifying at-risk students, whether there is a probability of a student fail or pass disadvantaged students. So, uh, well, I think this one is true for Turkish universities, uh, especially the foundation universities. There has been an increase in the number of students enrolling into higher education institutions. Uh, and according to the literature, it's not uh, valid for our uh, country. Uh, it's all over the world. There's the problem. Uh, there is an increase in the number of students who are unprepared to enter college. Probably you are the uh, people, <laughs> I mean the, the prep schools uh, comfort, uh, uh, are comforting such a problem, unprepared students. So uh, institutions have little or no control of the educational preparation of the students they enroll. They are making some programs. Uh, for example, Sabancı University has a um, program for, uh, I mean, teaching pre-math, pre-physics, and whatever. And, uh, but we all know that these students stand the highest risk of dropping out, or you are us uh, using so many effort to uh, pass these students and uh, problems. Okay, so why learning analytics? So we are using interaction data points. Uh, and for what? For student retention, for understanding teaching learning applications, predictions, interventions, systematic impact, personalization and adaptation. This is the design part of it. Uh, if we get rich data, if we can uh, use, uh, aggregate data for personalization, this may be, this is the way of making an adaptive learning system. So uh, actually we are, uh, are uh, researchers, I mean, in the education field, but we are using so many reductionist uh, um, approaches to deal with it. So this learning analytics is a way of making a holistic uh, approach. Uh, and it's at the systemic level uh, and some pedagogical, technical, and social uh, impact can be seen. OK. Now let me give you some examples. For example, Stanford University. Stanford University are complaining about the MOOC dropouts. Uh, it's really a matter. It, it, well, I, I, as far as I know, it is about 80% something dropout. Wow. Well, this may be have some uh, design problems and other problems. So. How can we use data to understand why they are dropping out? So you see the dashboard. Uh, they are building an analytic dashboard that will help uh, online instructors track student engagement. Uh, if you can track it, you can intervene it. Uh, so it is another part of it. Uh, it's a big issue. Uh, well, Pearson uh, Learning Studio also has an LMS infrastructure that aggregate data from millions of learners, millions, with the aim of enabling school leaders to design more effective learning paths. Uh, 
And uh, you see the numbers, it's huge. So it's, if you are online in a system, uh, you are tracked. That's it. Arizona State University made analytics a central component to improve student performance and retention. And there are other uh, universities for different uh, goals they are using, deploying uh, learning analytics. Baylor University, University of Alabama, Purdue signal system is quite interesting, so it's core signals, was developed to allow instructors the opportunity to employ the power of learning analytics to provide real-time feedback to a student, to a single student, not a group of students. Okay, <laughs> we can go further. Harvard, for example, uh, it's a learning catalytics, uh, it says, data using system. And uh, students log in the interactive classroom from a computer or mobile device. The professor produces a problem generated on the student screen for them to answer. The system analyzes at that time uh, the answers and decides how to pair students as to study partners. Uh, so they work with, and the professor receives a map of information displaying how the students did so the professor can decide who to assist. Uh, so this one is the way of using in the classroom on time. Uh, the learning analytics approaches. Well, uh, another one, uh, well, this one is for uh, Rio Salado. Uh, can predetermine student risk, risk based on reduced engagement and provide intervening responses. So uh, they try to determine at risk students and develop some intervening uh, approaches to deal with these students. Okay, so, uh, conclusion for this part. <laughs> uh, our purpose for learning analysis, for using learning analysis, improve graduation rates, identify students at risk, Improve the skill, skill levels of students. Remember the uh, is, is, uh, pairing the students in the classroom. Identify the needs of interventions. Uh, oh, okay. So what we are doing? Describing, diagnosing, and predicting by using learning analytics. Well, uh, there are some research studies at the uh, uh, academic field too. It's not just deployment uh, uh, learning analytics approaches in the universities, but for example, a learning analysis for English language teaching, how they use uh, learning analytics for English language teaching. They want to see the behavior of the behavior patterns of the students, how they are using the online system. And quite interesting because there are 20,000 students per day use the online platform. And you see uh, for the English homework. Okay, that they want to see the usage behavior of the students. Uh, and as a conclusion, they see that uh, students show fewer interactions with the platform in weeks before, during, and after school holidays. Okay, so it's decreasing. During the long summer break, the activity almost reached 0 0.0. Do you want to reach uh, the students at the summer break? Maybe. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Uh, 
the platform is used more frequently. It's very interesting. During the first half of a school week, I mean uh, Monday, isn't it? Tuesday, Wednesday. In the second half, the use is significantly lower. <laughs> okay. And on the weekend, only little user activity is visible on Saturday. Saturday is whole day. Whereas Sunday seems to be the day when many students doing their homework. So this is a way of uh, uh, using data, the online interactions, to see the student be able to understand how students work. Uh, well, so we can, as teachers, may uh, we can, uh, let's say, make some interventions uh, for these uh, or on these results. Okay. Now, for example, there are s some research studies for the academic performance of modeling. For example, one is uh, from our Ontolab research group that uh, Arif Hoca uh, was mentioned, uh, Arif Hoca mentioned yesterday. They conducted a prediction study for students' final grades based on their interactions with the wiki environment. And their feature set included student session and navigation metrics, as well as wiki-based metrics such as edit count and word count. And their results show that the final grades with uh, an accuracy of 67% can be predicted. And the other one uh, asserted that the source log data produced by conventional, <laughs> you see a learning management system uh, is now uh, labeled as conventional, could be mined to predict the student's success or failure without requiring the results of formal assessment. Formal, I mean the traditional assessment, we can uh, uh, predict the student's success and failure. And another one uh, is to predict which students might fail a course using students' online performances. Uh, one of the studies that we uh, conducted, uh, the aim of the study is to model students' academic performance based on their interactions in an online learning environment. Again, it's a, I think it's the, it was the Moodle environment. And the data set includes 10 input attributes. Now, I'm, uh, I put it here for the purpose of giving you what data points mean uh, in an online environment. For example, here. Uh, so these are different than in our research, uh, in our traditional research studies like dependent variables, independent variables, and so on. Look at this, login count, usage total time in minutes, post count, number of texts used in posts, number of navigations to posts written by other students, number of assessment of posts written by other students, number of written responses to questions in the discussion section, Number of navigations to the discussion section. <laughs> Number of navigations to the questions and answers. Number of assessment of questions in the discussion section. And of course, the great final, uh, gr final grades, let's <laughs> say, final grades. You see the metrics you can use uh, for analyzing the student performance. Okay, well, there are, uh, okay. I'm going to finish. So the, these are the results. We can predict the pass and fail students in a month uh, by using their interactions. Okay. And another one is uh, to um, identify the similarities among the students in an online environment and uh, see the relationship between the uh, achievement performance. So you can cluster the students according to their behaviors in their um, online environment. Uh, 
yeah, and we see three clusters, cluster one, two, and three. It's uh, interesting to see the relationship between the academic performance and these clusters. Uh, so, uh, what can we do at the end of these research uh, findings? So we cluster similar behaviors. We can cluster similar behaviors. We can then adapt students' course by using course squidging, uh, preparedness, how it is, uh, important teaching and learning variables, what are these in the online environment, pre-university profiles, help-seeking, and at risk. So, okay, let's see. Uh, up to now, <laughs> uh, it is uh, well a way of uh, using learning analytics for, uh, let's say, uh, positive um, uh, implications. But there are certain critical aspects of learning analytics. There are certain debates on it. For example, tracking student data in this way makes for a yeah, and analysis of, I mean, decrease the analysis of creativity. Uh, and uh, it may uh, lead to make false decisions. And, uh, well, maybe the most important one is the misuse of data, data about students, and uh, individual privacy is an important factor. And uh, so who owns the data? Who is going to use the data? So these are the critical issues of LA. Now, the last thing, uh, <laughs> let's jump to another field of <laughs> uh, using uh, data uh, in, for example, making a movie. How can we make a movie or a sitcom? by using data analysis. Now, there is a very, very excellent uh, presentation uh, at TED Talks. Sebastian Wernick, how to use data to make a hit TV show. Uh, well, <laughs> you see this curve is an interesting curve to show you the uh, number of movies with a given weighted uh, rating. This is the rating. Well, uh, if the movie gets a rating of 9.2 something and greater than, uh, equals to and greater than 9.2, it's a good movie. Continue. But if it is less than 7.4, they are always uh, you know, measuring it, you have to eliminate that movie. But it's important to decide on the movies uh, which have ratings between 7.4 and 9.2. It's not so easy to it. Now, Stefan gives us two uh, interesting uh, movie production. One is the Amazon Studio. Now, uh, they want to uh, pro produce a sitcom uh, which, will, uh, which may get a rating of, a rating of greater than 9.2, okay? So what's the way of doing it? Now, uh, they get the ideas for TV shows, evaluation, and then, make a, a decision to produce eight candidate episodes, right? Put online, free, free, free. and uh, the, well, the people, people try to uh, reach it and uh, watch it, but they are being watched too, <laughs> okay? And they collect millions of data points about these eight episodes. And which one is the most uh, rated one? Is the Alpha House. Do you remember the Alpha House? 
No. Okay. No. Amazon uh, made a sitcom about four Republican senators, but the ratings get 7.4. It's not the, their goal. But on the other hand, Netflix. <laughs> you know the House of Cards? Yes, the House of Now let's they, uh, see their approach, how they use data points. They look at all the data they had about Netflix viewers, the ratings they give their shows, the weaving histories, what shows people like or not. They explore the bits and pieces about the audience. They decided to make a movie on a single US senator, which is the House of Cards. Guess the rating. 9.2, 9.2. Then, what is the difference between these uh, approaches? <laughs> okay, I'm back. Now, education is a very complex adaptive system. There are a lot of la yeah, a large number of interaction parts, networks, and also we know that the whole is greater than the sum. And, and there are emergent behaviors that we cannot predict. Okay, what will be the conclusion for this presentation? Now, learning analytics is an emerging field to understand better the teaching learning process, yes. Data is a massively useful tool to make better decisions, but at the end, we need expert opinions based on data analysis. Don't rely on completely to data analysis. Your views are important. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> do we have any questions for our plenary speaker? Maybe in the break we can answer the questions. Okay. Yes. We have a question. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, it was a really interesting presentation. I'm just wondering what your thoughts might be on uh, the students having access to this data so that they become uh, participants in it. So it's not us knowing about them but it's a reflection of their choices and what they do. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, they are online. The students are online. The important thing about learning analytics is to provide feedback to the students. So the students get some useful information about their development. So that's, that's the point. If you are not using data for their improvement, for the feedback. It is, it's for uh, you know the educational leaders probably. It's not so important. That's the point I think. Any other questions? Any other questions? There's one more question there. Here comes your microphone. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this interesting presentation. Um, well, I'm not so familiar with uh, data analytics, analytics and these studies in education from the empirical point of view because I work on the philosophy of education basically. But uh, I think you were very right in um, addressing a point. Data alone can mislead us, but data should be interpreted. Uh, and I was thinking of an example, like a thought experiment, you know. Imagine that there's a student named Alex. Uh, he gives his password to his sister. And his sister was, you know, by using his password, in fact, logging in, uh, in the data, um, in whatever, I don't know basically the <laughs> scheme of this uh, online uh, issues, but uh, imagine that instead of him, his sister is uh, having access 
uh, to the uh, online uh, materials. So uh, if we rely only on the uh, data, then we might think Alex is, you know, uh, actively participating, but in fact, behind the scenes, his sister was participating. So I don't know if that makes sense, uh, really, but I was just, you know, yeah. well, it's contemplating. It's, it's possible, of course, but yeah. There are certain learning analytics to, tools to detect these discrepancies, probably. <laughs> they are working on it. <laughs> but there is always the human factor. Sure, sure, sure, yeah. sure, always, yeah. always. Yeah. always yeah. So. Okay, any other questions? I know I have a few, but um, maybe I'll ask them later. Okay. Okay, great. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>